Have you ever felt invisible in a place where you're supposed to feel safe? As a black girl in an Indian family, I often struggled to piece together my identity. I experienced feelings of confusion and misunderstanding and that sting of invisibility. My feelings and my emotions just amplified when my family uprooted moving from our home country in Jamaica to a brand new one. Culture shock hit me hard. I felt like an outsider. Feelings of inferiority and insecurity flooded me because everything about me was different. From the way I talked, to the way I walked, to the way I dressed, down to the foods that I ate. All of those things made me a target for ridicule in my American classroom. And so I did the thing that kept me feeling safe, and that was to make myself invisible. So I silenced my voice, everything about me, to not feel that pain and not feel that shame. And then Ms. Fernandez came. Ms. Fernandez was the first American <laughs> teacher that I had who really saw me. She saw my value and she saw my differences not as deficits, but as reasons for celebration. I remember Ms. Fernandez's classroom being a, a, an explosion of culture and community from the field trips where we explored the city to the guest speakers who captivated us with their stories and even the Spanish spelling bees that stretched us but also gave us confidence. And who could forget Ms. Fernandez's Fridays at La Tienda where I was introduced to Café con Leche <laughs> and we savored in those galletas and dulces, and we even sang songs, y'all, like Guantanamera, Guajira, Guantanamera. <laughs> Miss Fernandez taught us lessons that no textbook ever could. And those lessons left an indelible mark on my future. When I became a mother and I saw my daughter drifting into disengagement, I called on culture and community like Ms. Fernandez taught me. When I became a teacher, I made sure the culture and the community was a core of my classroom so my students would have a sense of belonging. And as a community member in this very community that has helped to raise me, I championed the connection between the classroom and the community. Now, I've been an educator for over 20 years, so I know that Ms. Fernandez's methods are just transformational, but they are not the norm. They are not the status quo. In fact, our educational system has a critical gap. 54% of students are of color. 82% of teachers are not. So here's what that means for someone who looks like me. A black child has a very slim chance of having a black teacher in their K through 12 educational career. 7% of teachers in this entire country are black. 2% of teachers in this entire country are black males. Now that is a profound injustice. And that's an injustice that goes far beyond representation. That injustice affects the learning and the growth and even the achievement of students of color. When students are given messages, whether they're overt or implicit, when these messages tell them that their lives and their identities and their backgrounds and their cultures are not good enough, that is an injustice. These messages show up in curriculum gaps and they show up in legislation and they show up in the biases that exist. But what if we as a community could come together to bridge that gap? What if we could contribute to the cultural richness of classrooms 
just as it takes a community, just as it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a community to raise a classroom. So I invite you to walk with me as we explore two simple ways that we, as a community, can raise our classrooms. Number one, we can tell our diverse stories in the curriculum and in our lives. There's a silent crisis that's called student disengagement. And student disengagement basically is when a student is not connected to the curriculum. And student disengagement comes in many forms. Part of it is when students receive or are exposed to curriculum that does not reflect their lived experiences. When they are faced with curriculum that's not, that does not show people who look like them in joyful or positive ways. And when they are exposed to curriculum and experiences in the learning materials that show black and brown people as stereotypes and victims. That is why they need diverse stories. That's why they need cultural stories. And that is why they need our stories. I remember a few years ago, my daughter and I sat down at a dining room table to interview my grandfather for a school project that she had to do about her, our family history. And my grandfather told us these beautiful stories of his childhood, of his mom and dad, and of his older brothers and his sisters, and all the love that they shared. It was so evident, and we felt it. But he also talked about his struggles and his challenges of leaving the home that he built and the family that, and the business that he built, and even some of the family back in Jamaica to come to the United States to start from the bottom. Stories like these, where students can see themselves and feel themselves and hear themselves, are what we need in classrooms because through these stories, that's where students can connect. So what if we whipped out our phones to record stories of us, stories of our families, and stories of our community members, like the elders in our churches and our organizations? We record those stories and we can share them as personal storytelling projects. We can share them as community storytelling events, or we can share them with schools as resources. That's how we as a community can raise a classroom with our stories. Point number two, we as a community can connect our network with the classroom. Research tells us there's lots of benefits to guest speakers, right? We know that. I've been doing guest, I was doing guest speakers back in Ms. Fernandez's class, as the kids say it these days, in the 1900s, right? <laughs> but <laughs> the value of guest speakers come from the fact that they need to mirror the diverse richness of the students who are sitting in the classroom. They need to look like the students who are sitting in those classrooms, right? And they also need to be able to tell students about experiences that are not just tied to their careers. They need to talk about skills that students need for their future, like leadership and empathy and resilience and a growth mindset. So let me illustrate this, uh, give you a really quick example. I can invite my pastor <laughs> to come to my classroom and speak to my students, but he doesn't have to talk about religion. Instead, he talks about leadership. He talks to the students about servant leadership as they prepare to read Julius Caesar. How about a young black girl going back to her elementary school to read a book that she wrote and she talks to the students about the importance of literacy, but she also talks to them about her experience going to an HBCU, a historically black college or university, where it's developed her cultural awareness and her empathy. Now for the students who's never heard of an HBCU, now they know what it is, they're intrigued. And the students who have, it's developed their sense of pride. So I ask you, who is in your network? Who's in your phone? Who's in your address book? Who's on your social media contact list that you can tap into to connect to classrooms? Because that's how we, as a community, can raise classrooms. Now, as I come to a close, I am reminded of that nine-year-old immigrant girl who was once silenced 
by her differences and needed those lessons that went far beyond the traditional teaching and the textbook. My journey is illustrative of how powerful it is when a community connects and a community empowers a classroom. So I invite you to, number one, tell your stories. Number two, tap into your network so that we as a community can reimagine our realities and raise our classrooms. Thank you.